Um, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation to speak today. Um, I want to share a little bit with you about some of the work we've been doing at Horizon Quantum Computing to try to abstract away quantum computing, to get to a point where it's easy for end users to be able to write quantum applications without having to worry about the details of the hardware, and indeed without having to worry about what quantum computing is at all. Um, one of the reasons we care about this the reason we think about doing this at all is because it's really hard to develop applications for quantum computers. There's a number of barriers to actually achieving this. First of all, quantum computing is extremely non-intuitive. Um, it relies on interference between different branches of a wave function, different branches of computation, in a way that we don't really have day-to-day -day experience with as humans. So it really is outside the realm of our experience to try to construct quantum algorithms. And so it takes an awful lot of effort and experience before we're actually able to make decent progress there. Another barrier we have is that at the moment, the hardware is imperfect. It's very noisy and there's a diverse range of quantum hardware architectures. And so writing code that has high performance on one uh, generally means it won't work well on another piece of hardware. Uh, and that means your code's not really portable. So you're writing code that works well on one device, but not on another. Finally, the, the languages we have today really lack abstraction. They're really piecing together quantum circuits gate by gate by gate. And if you think about it, writing a complex piece of quantum software via an assembly language or something that's even lower, piecing together a a logic circuit that would implement that program is really a very daunting task. And it's hard to imagine how you would be able to write something that look, looked like modern software if you were restricted to that level of detail. Um, but things could be different. You know, imagine if you could write code that was fast and efficient on a conventional computer, but was automatically accelerated on quantum hardware. Um, imagine if you could make if you could make it so that domain experts who are already capable of programming conventional computers, we're able to take advantage of quantum hardware uh, to accelerate their applications without having to know the details of it, without needing a PhD, so that you could give people in, for example, the oil and gas industry, in, in computational fluid dynamics and finance and other sectors, the capability to build quantum enhanced programs without needing to understand the underlying model and being able to write code that works well both on classical hardware and, uh, and on quantum hardware. So what we're doing at Horizon is to essentially build this abstraction there. We're building the capability to go from classical code uh, written in high-level programming languages like Python and MATLAB and compile those down into something that can be run on a quantum computer. And that means going all the way from automatically constructing a quantum algorithm that does the same thing as the classical code, but in a way that scales better, uh, all the way down to the set of pulse sequences that need to go to, uh, go to say, a superconducting processor or to an ion trap in order to actually implement that computation. Um, and we're doing this in a way that it sits between the user and the hardware so that we really abstract away the need for the user to understand the hardware at all. Um, what our tool chain looks like that we've been building up it, it is the following. Essentially, there's three different layers to it. The first layer is concerned with um, essentially algorithm synthesis. And that means taking some classical code written that in such a way that you could run it on a conventional computer and it would be fast, would just be regular computer code, and automatically constructing a quantum algorithm from that. And that means analyzing the code, automatically refactoring it, pulling apart loops, pulling apart recursive function calls, matching the elementary building blocks we get within them and making replacements, uh, replacing quantum subroutines for classical ones, uh, quantum data structures for classical data structures, uh, and in doing so, constructing a quantum algorithm for the same task that behaves in exactly the same way with the same side effects as the classical code. Now, taking that quantum algorithm and compiling that down into a concrete quantum circuit, mapping that to the hardware, to the constraints of the hardware for the particular processor that we're trying to deploy on. And this might be connectivity constraints. It might take into account imperfections in the couplings, imperfections in the qubits on the device. 
um, as well as the instruction set of the device, being able to automatically convert to the instruction set for any particular device. And then the final layer is concerned with deployment, wrapping all of this up uh, and deploying it so that it lives in the cloud at some URL so that it's essentially an API that the user can access with their input to the program without ever needing to worry about the details behind that of how all of, all of the quantum processing is working. So this is what we think about when we think about deploying quantum applications. Um, at Horizon, we've been building up this tool chain uh, and we've been starting from a very low level. So we've been starting from the level of, of hardware and understanding the imperfections of hardware, uh, being able to rapidly characterize hardware um, more rapidly with less measurements than is conventionally the case. And the reason for this is so that we can understand the imperfections in chips uh, and mitigate those errors as much as possible. So within our compiler, at the lowest level of the compiler, um, when we're mapping from an idealized quantum circuit that we start with, down to a concrete quantum circuit that we're going to implement on the device. We do this in a kind of characterization aware way, so that we're taking in a characterization of the hardware that tells us which qubits are good, which qubits are bad, which couplings are good, which couplings are bad. Uh, and we take that into account in our gate synthesis process and in our hardware mapping process, so that we implement the constraints, the connectivity constraints of the hardware and, and route the qubits appropriately. Um, we've developed a, we've been developing new techniques for characterization itself so that we can get the number of measurements required down to a manageable level. Realistically, for a superconducting device, it might be the case that really you have perhaps 30 minutes every four hours for characterization, and we want to get as detailed a characterization as possible within that time. Um, it turns out that if you look at the performance of hardware, Oftentimes, you will see qubits that are not behaving themselves well at all. Uh, and it's tempting to think that when you see this, uh, when you see this strange behavior, that the qubit is in a very mixed state, that there's a lot of noise being introduced. Um, but in this case, if we, if we look at this graph um, uh, of, uh, of oscillations of qubits, you see this, this trace outlined in red for one particular qubit is really all over the place. And it looks like it's really not behaving itself at all. However, if you dig into the details, it turns out that that qubit is actually pretty close to a pure state. So it is undergoing some kind of unitary evolution. It's just not going, undergoing the evolution we expect. And so if we had a better characterization of what that, um, of what that evolution was, we might be able to make use of that to do better gates so that we wouldn't be losing that qubit at all, but we'll be able to make use of it properly. Um, one of the areas we focused on in particular is characterizing straight couplings within devices. So oftentimes in superconducting processors, for example, you have ZZ couplings between different qubits on the device um, that aren't supposed to be there, that the manufacturers aren't necessarily aware of where they are on the device between which qubits they are. Um, and the effect of this is a little bit problematic. What it means is that if you, have, uh, if you have a neighboring qubit that is coupling to the qubit you care about, um, then the, that coupling means that when the neighbor is in zero, the energy level is shifted. And when the, when the energy of the neighbor is raised from zero to one, the energy level of the first qubit changes. And this means the rate at which it picks up phase also changes. So the frequency of the qubit is effectively affected by the state of its neighbors. And that's, a, that's problematic for a number of reasons. So it turns out that you can try to map this out on a device using joint Ramsey experiments. Um, and if you do this, basically what you do is you prepare a qubit in a, a superposition of zero and one, and you apply an artificial rotation to it. So you're slowly rotating the qubit. And you take a particular neighboring qubit and you, uh, you put it in zero and you do this experiment measuring at different time intervals and you plot the trace. And then you take that, that neighbor and you flip it to one and you do the same thing again. And when you do this, you would expect both, both traces to line up one on top of the other if the neighbor was not coupled. You know, we expect none of the qubits to be coupled to one another, um, but Oftentimes, there is some coupling there that's unanticipated. 
So one of the areas we've put in quite a lot of work is being able to map out these couplings on devices using as few measurements as possible. Um, and the reason we want to map them out is so that we can mitigate the error they introduce to the qubits, because essentially these are, these are introducing a dephasing error into each of the qubits. Um, so this is an example of, uh, of a qubit within a Rigetti processor. Um, in red is the decay of the qubit over time uh, as it's initially characterized. But if we take into account these couplings between different qubits, and we use that to update the frequency of the qubit so that instead of being in the case that we're matching the frequency when all of the neighbors are in zero, instead we're in the middle of the binomial distribution that we get when they're all in superposition or when they're randomly in zero or one, as they would be in the middle of a computation. Even just updating the frequency of the qubit, that leads to this green line, which gives you some improvement in the lifetime of the qubit. And then if we go a bit further and we add in active decoupling, for example, with echo, with echo pulses, uh, then we do better again. Um, however, this is, this is already a reasonably well-behaved qubit. If we look at another qubit on the same device, we see really much more dramatic behavior. Um, in this case, the qubit is rather miscalibrated on the initial device. Uh, and you can see this by the fact that the red line isn't just decaying, but it's actually slowly oscillating as well. And that means the qubit's actually picking up some phase, even though it's not supposed to be. Um, if we just update the frequency of that, we have better performance immediately. Um, and if we go one step further and we start doing uh, actively decoupling this from the rest of the system, we really extend the lifetime by very, uh, a very large amount. In this case, it's about sevenfold. Um, but this is a bit problematic. You can't just decouple one qubit from the rest of the system. Um, if we were to try to do this with all of the qubits, we would essentially wind up flipping all of the qubits at the same time, and they wouldn't decouple from one another. So instead, what we can do is we can take into account this kind of characterization of where the straight couplings are in the device to partition the device, to partition the qubits into different sets, and decouple one set from another. And if we do that, that's where we're getting this yellow line. So it's not quite as good as if we protect the qubit that we're looking at directly, but it gives pretty similar performance and it's protecting all of the qubits on the device, not just one. Um, here's an ex you know, this is just showing you the joint Ramsey experiments with and without this mitigation in place. Um, so we've developed techniques to multiplex these kind of joint Ramsey experiments and other kinds of characterization experiments so that we can map out the couplings on a device. And in this case, on the screen in front of you, there's uh, an actual characterization for one of Rigetti's processors, uh, an Aspen 8 processor. Um, and so we're able to do this with uh, in a way that scales logarithmically with the number of qubits in the device compared to a quadratic scaling for joint Ramsey. Um, and that means that actually the, the characterization we get, the, the graph we get of the couplings is much more accurate for the same shot budget. So for the same amount of time doing experiments, doing calibration experiments, we can get a much better picture of what the couplings within the device look like. So that gives you some idea of what we're doing at the very lowest level at just calibrating hardware uh, and doing some simple error mitigation. This, this is really at the base level, at the lowest level of our system. Um, what we have above this is a gate level programming language. So this is something like Quasim or Quill. Pretty much all of the quantum gate languages are, are very similar. Um, but one difference between our language that we call hydrogen, uh, is that each of the operations within it, so you see on the right here, you see qubit and you see H and C naught. Um, our compiler doesn't actually know what any of them are. Instead, each of them is defined in a structured text file like this. So you can see an example here where C naught is defined. We're saying that the dimensions in, there's two subsystems, each of which has dimension two. And there's two output subsystems, each of which has dimension two. So we're really saying this is a two qubit gate. And we're defining it by its Krauss operators. So in this case, it's a, a unitary, so there's only one Krauss operator. Um, and so that's defining the action of the gate. Um, similarly, for measurements, 
we're labeling these in as general a way as possible by, by giving a list of POVM elements. And this allows us to ex essentially express as general an instruction set as is reasonably possible within a quantum computer, at least under a kind of Markovian assumption. And that means that we can use our system to program essentially any kind of device. And what we've been doing with this is we've been building up the capability to synthesize between one instruction set and another. So instead of having just one of these language files where it's defining a gate set, we can have several of them. So we can have an input gate set and an, out, an output gate set and use gate synthesis to go from a program written with one set to a program expressed in the others. And this allows us to change between different instruction sets for different kinds of processors. Um, we do this in a way where we put a lot of effort into optimization so that the circuits generated should be pretty efficient. Um, going beyond this gate level construction, um, we have a quantum programming language that we've built building that basically uses the flow control of BASIC. Um, we call this Helium. And um, basically it's the, the same gate level operations as before, defined in the same way with structured text files, but it has the flow control of BASIC. So it has if statements, it has uh, essentially numeric for loops, monitored while loops, and the ability to implement things like subroutines. Um, one of the reasons for doing this is so that you're programming the quantum computer in a way that is quantum mechanical. You're not piecing together a circuit bit by bit in Python. You're not using Python loops to unroll fours for you already. Instead, you have that structure, you have the loop structure, you have the control flow all in your quantum program. And this is really useful for optimization, for, for taking what would unroll to be a very large quantum circuit and applying optimization in a very efficient manner so that you can go from a very complicated circuit to a much simpler circuit. So in this case, um, you know, this is just an example of uh, a circuit passing through uh, our optimizer in our compiler. In this case, if you do a quantum Fourier transform on three qubits, uh, then you implement an incrementer, and then you undo the quantum Fourier transform. Well, it turns out it's going to simplify to a number of Z rotations on individual qubits. And so you, you wind up with no entangling gates at all. You wind up with a far more efficient circuit. Now, in this language, we've gone one step further, rather than just building a quantum programming language at this kind of uh, relatively low level, we've also added in a number of extra steps. Of course, we can use things like subroutines to be able to implement um, important operations, maybe error correction on uh, measurements, different kinds of things like this. But we can also use, uh, we can now also include subroutines written in C to implement classical computation in a really efficient way. So the way we do this is basically by specifying that we want to include a C file uh, right at the start of our program. So that you can see this up in the top left, we're including this C to Q file. And then at some point later, we can decide to call a subroutine that's basically defined by that C to Q file. Um, and in this case, we're just going to do an adder. So our C to Q file, what that's doing is basically telling us how we're going to generate a, uh, a classical subroutine from, uh, from some C code in, uh, as a re reversible circuit that can be used within a quantum program. So first of all, we specify the language that it's going to be C. And at the moment, C is really the only language we support. Um, then we need to give an entry point to the, uh, to the um, C code. So that's just naming the function we want to call. We need to specify the file that we're going to use. Uh, and then we have some compiler flags. We're saying a mode, and that's kind of telling the compiler what we care about. Do we care about building a very low depth circuit? Do we care about a reasonable set of trade-offs instead? Um, or are we going to do it in a way that we know is going to be used, for example, as an oracle in something like a Grover search, where what's going to happen is there's going to be some classical computation performed, then that's going to be used to uh, maybe flip some ancilla, and then it's going to be uncomputed. Um, and the reason this is important, because if that's the case, we don't actually need to implement the circuit directly. Instead, we only need to get the 
unitary correct up to phase, because once we do the uncomputations, that will cancel out, and it commutes with the flipping of the ancillary qubit in something like Grover's algorithm. Um, we also need to specify some information about the types for the inputs of the function and for the outputs. But when we do this, it turns out we're able to compile to really, really efficient uh, quantum circuits. Um, we have a number of different flags. Um, I've mentioned before the ability to compile oracles when we're working with Grover's algorithm, the ability to compile low depth or low t-depth circuits. Um, but we also have a number of choices that lead to different different trade-offs, whether you want to do linear operations in place or out of place, whether you want to use some kind of partial on sorry, some kind of partial uncomputation to free up qubits during the computation so that you can reuse ancillas and minimize the total number of qubits you use. Um, you might ask how well this works. And that's, a, that's an important question. Um, it's one thing to build something, but it's another thing to be sure that what we've built actually works well. So we've recently benchmarked this against uh, some existing methods in the literature uh, for computing some important functions. Um, in the case of what I'm showing you on the screen, uh, this, this is a particular function we're computing at the exponential of minus x. Now, this is important. There was a paper from Goldman Sachs a little while ago on derivatives pricing that was using this as a major part of their, uh, their procedure within a Grover loop to do derivatives pricing. Um, now, this is kind of the most costly function in the procedure. Uh, and in the original paper, they relied on uh, a construction proposed in a paper by Hannah Rotler and Svor. Um, and it, uh, you know, it, if you look at the number of gates used by it, it seems like it's something like 15,000 gates if we were to try to compute that inverse exponential up to 21 bits of precision. So for us, uh, you know, that isn't the best point of comparison. There was a paper earlier this year that used some more optimized constructions and it reduces the number of qubits used, uh, sorry, the number of Toffley gates used quite a lot down to about 1,600. Uh, if your x is in the range 0 to 10, or about 900 if x is in the range 0 to 100. Um, what we tried to do to basically benchmark our system was take the method that was used, but not the circuits that were used, and instead write it up in C and compile it and see how we get off, uh, see how we do. And basically, what we found is that by passing through our C compiler because of all of, the optimization, uh, all of the optimizations that are made, all of the effort that's put into uh, uh, pruning off um, parts of the computation that have no effect on the output, um, we get down to lower numbers of gates. So in the case X is in the range zero to 10, we get about, uh, about a one and a quarter time improvement. But if X is in the range zero to 100, we get up to a 6.5%, uh, sorry, a 6.5 times reduction in the number of, uh, of Toffee gates needed, going from 912 gates down to 140 gates, which is a pretty striking improvement. Uh, when all we're doing is um, is basically using a couple of lines of C code. In this case, it's about 15 lines of C code, and then just running this through an automated compiler in order to get a highly optimized circuit out. So it seems like we're getting pretty good performance from the, the C to quantum compiler that we've implemented. The next slide I wanna show you is just to show you some of the trade-offs we have within the compiler itself. So the different modes I mentioned, there is no best mode. And the choice to do things in place or out of place, or to use qubit reuse or not, there is no best choice. And um, doing either one of these, you know, necessitates some kind of trade-off. Now, if we know that you only need to implement the unit tree up to some phase, uh, on each of the computational basis states, then you do get a strict saving. Um, you do significantly better than you would if you had to implement the unit tree exactly. However, if you're going between the standard Oracle mode and low TDEP mode, for example, or you're choosing to do things in place or out of place, you're kind of trading the number of C knots versus the number of Toffley gates or T gates versus the depth of the circuit. And there's no best choice. There's different settings that will minimize different numbers. 
uh, different metrics. So they'll be better according to different metrics. And it's really up to the programmer to decide what they're aiming for. What's the metric they're trying to minimize? Beyond, uh, beyond hydrogen, beyond helium, this kind of basic programming language that we've been building up, we've been building up a higher level programming language uh, that's a little bit more like a kind of quantum C++. Um, and the reason we've been doing that excuse me. Um, the reason we've been doing that is to try to reach a higher level of abstraction. Um, in particular, we want to get to the point where you can start to write new data structures, new data types in a quantum programming language that could be reused again and again and again. Now, we want to get to the point where the amount of code you need to write is small. So for example, that you may be able to do something like a, a rotation, but instead of doing a rotation gate straight off, we do it where the angle is parameterized by something spelled out, uh, some angle spelled out in a bit string of other qubits, as for example, is used in the HHL algorithm a lot. Um, so we want to get to the point where we can implement these building blocks in a way that the the programmer only has to write maybe one line of code, but actually it's building up a very complex quantum circuit underneath. So we're getting to a point where the code you need to write looks more like the pseudo code in an algorithms paper instead of the actual, you know, gate by gate description that you need to go to if you actually want to implement something uh, on hardware today. Um, we want to be able to give programmers the chance to build up new data structures, to build up support for new data types, uh, essentially via classes. So being able to define ways to represent um, different abstract data types using, for example, quantum states. So we had a paper a while ago where we looked at using uh, graph states as a way to represent graphs. And it turns out if you do this, although it's a, a really you know, stupidly simple analogy, um, it actually leads to a data structure that has provably better trade-offs than is possible classically. It doesn't give you the full range of operations you may care about for, for a graph data structure, but the fact that the trade-offs, that you can prove these dichotomy theorems about trade-offs that exceed what you can do classically um, is really interesting to me. And it seems like it's an important place that's still unexplored in quantum computing. We do so little work around data structures still at this point in our evolution, and we want to be able to add in support for that. Uh, and we're doing all of this with the view of trying to get to a point where we can go from entirely classical code and compile that all the way down. And that leads me on to our highest level, which we call carbon, which is basically going from classical code and automatically constructing a quantum, uh, a quantum program for that, which can then be compiled through beryllium or helium all the way down to something that can run on quantum hardware. So in order to do this, um, basically, we want to tackle the different sources of complexity within a, within a classical program. So you write a program. Um, it's never really the length of your code that determines the runtime for that program. Rather, it's the amount of uses of loops, for example. You know, how many times you go through a loop, whether you've nested loops. Um, it's also recursive uh, function calls, where you call a function that calls itself or calls another function that calls it, and the whole process telescopes out so that you call the same piece of code some unbounded number of times. The other source of complexity that we have is kind of implicit complexity, where we have a single line of code that has a high implicit cost. So if we're in a language like MATLAB, perhaps where multiplying matrices or computing determinants that are one line of code, but actually it's an operation that scales badly with the size of the operation, uh, the size of the data we're working with, the size of the matrix we're operating on. And we try to tackle each of these in different ways. So for the implicit complexity, we're trying to deal with that essentially, as I said before, with better data structures, with better algorithms for manipulating data. Um, the way we deal with the explicit complexity with these loops, for example, and recursive function calls, is that we try to break them apart. So given a large loop, 
what we'll try to do is make parts of it, parts of the code within it independent from one another and start to pull them apart and to make separate loops. So we're splitting our loops again and again and again to get to a high number of different loops in sequence rather than one single big loop. Uh, and the reason we do this is so that we can start to look at these smaller, simpler loops and recognize what they do and then replace them with a special function that says what they do and implement that in as efficient a way as we possibly can. And oftentimes you can do it much more efficiently than the loop could itself, particularly if you're in a position to exploit quantum processing. So you can use amplitude amplification, for example, to accelerate uh, loops that look like linear search or extremal value searches, uh, just as an example. Okay, I wanted to show you this on some example code. Now, this is a pretty meaningless program, um, but it's one where you can see the manipulation happen in just a couple of steps. So in this case, we've got, um, we've got a matrix that's defined heat map. It's uh, 10,000 by 10,000. Um, it's followed by a set of nested for loops that fill in the ij to entry of heat map uh, recursively. And then as you go down, um, you have a second loop that basically uh, searches for extremal value on that and a, a final loop that will uh, that will go down through the I uh, through the diagonal entries of this heat map matrix uh, and find one that's greater than five find the first one that's greater than five um, this isn't really very meaningful code and we have much more meaningful examples uh, and if you want to see any of those, I encourage you to reach out to us and I'll show you uh, some real code that actually solves meaningful problems being accelerated. Um, but this 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 one is a pretty uh, useful example in terms of showing a lot of things happening all at once, a lot of simplifications happening. So first of all, the first thing that happens when you put this to a compiler is that the this middle loop gets split in two parts. So this is what I'm talking about, breaking loops into independent parts. Um, the next thing that happens is that the loops we have are each now at a simple enough uh, point that they can be classified. So the first one, we're just defining the ij entry of a matrix. And because we represent matrices in a very different way, instead of storing the ij to element, instead of storing the matrix in memory, we store the functions to compute the ij to elements. And that's much more mem memory efficient for us. It means we don't need to go through the loops at all. And it's compatible with doing uh, a lot of the fast linear algebra um, techniques that have become that have become quite common in quantum algorithms, uh, such as the HHL algorithm. Um, the next the next loop we're left with, it turns out we can solve that analytically. So it can be solved by the compiler uh, done at compile time rather than at runtime, and so it can be eliminated. Uh, and then we have uh, something that is a maximum value search. So basically we have a loop and within that loop, there's a conditional uh, and the condition is updated each time it's satisfied. So it has no effect until that is met, but then it updates the condition again. And we can use uh, amplitude amplification techniques to, to get a quadratic speed up on this type of operation. Um, the final example is a sequential search, where again, we can get a quadratic speed up using, uh, using amplitude amplification techniques. Um, so overall, you're essentially getting exponential speed ups on the matrix definition uh, and on the piece that can be analytically solved. Uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of meaningless because it was split off a loop. Um, but the first saving is quite big because that was previously the dominant factor in the runtime for that code. Uh, and the other two factors, the, the, um, the extremal value search and the linear search, each of those picks up basically a square root speed up. Um, so overall, you're getting a speed up of basically a fourth root. Uh, 
uh, for this uh, for this code. So if you look at the reduction in the total number of algorithm, uh, sorry, the total number of operations uh, for the for the quantum code versus the classical code, um, it turns out that it's a multiplicative factor of about three hundred thousand times fewer operations just for that simple bit of code I showed you there. Now, that wasn't very meaningful code, it was very simple, but we can do this with much more complicated, much more meaningful pieces of MATLAB code. And the reason we've been starting with MATLAB and Octave uh, is because those are programming languages where matrices are the primary, are the primary sorry, where matrices are the primary data type. Um, and that's really useful to us because a lot of the techniques that we use uh, are aimed at doing fast matrix algebra. Uh, and that can lead to exponential speed ups, particularly when we're working with, for example, sparse matrices. Uh, and so we want to have as much of that as possible. Um, and if we were to make uh, the choice to look at Python or something like that instead, then instead we would be more focused on dictionaries and things like this rather than on matrices. And we don't uh, we don't pick up as large speed ups from those as we can do from matrix uh, matrix algebra and tensor calculations. Okay, so I want to thank you very much for taking the time uh, to listen. Um, if you're interested at all in what we're doing, um, feel free to reach out. Uh, and I look forward to hearing you. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak. Goodbye.